we are here today to discuss uh, last Friday's initial workshop held by the Public Utilities Commission on integrated grid planning here in Maine to help with our decarbonization goals. Uh, my name is Rebecca Schultz, and I'm a senior advocate for climate and clean energy at the Natural Resources Council of Maine, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Um, uh, and I'll start out by providing a little bit of, uh, sorry about that, a little bit of background and context, um, you know, and then I'll, and then I'll open up to the panel to give, give some overview and from there we'll, we'll step into some, some questions. Um, I, I will say that integrated grid planning, just by way of background, also called holistic grid planning sometimes is really an attempt to step back and see the power sector in its entirety to see across the mess of legacy incentives and vested interests that are stifling progress today to find better ways to build and plan and operate our grid to achieve our climate goals uh, as quickly, as cheaply, and really as equitably as possible. Um, it's always helpful to keep in mind that for over 100 years, utilities have been building and operating large generators and turning them on and off to meet demand. But today we need clean renewable energies dispersed at all scales across the grid. And then we need to match demand with that clean energy supply through a resilient and dynamic and flexible responsive system. So really this means a huge growth opportunity for our electric utilities. And that's really important to keep in mind. That's what this is about. But on the other hand, we're also experiencing this incredible proliferation of powerful consumer technologies in the form of rooftop and community solar and battery storage in people's basements and on at uh, substations and programmable thermostats and heat pumps and EVs all distributed throughout the distribution system. Um, these technologies carry promises of clean energy and clean air and cost savings and resilience and independence and personalized and localized solutions that really amount to an unprecedented benefit to consumers, but also an unprecedented disruption to both the incumbent companies and the, the regulatory paradigm that we use to control those companies and try to keep them accountable. Um, so that's what holistic grid planning <laughs> is trying to deal with. That's this uh, approach that is gaining momentum in states across the country uh, to challenge the status quo and to try to build solutions that really serve the interests of main people, not our utilities first and foremost. Um, so, uh, you know, even before Maine adopted these integrated grid planning requirements last year, energy experts and stakeholders have been calling for Maine to adopt this for years. And the requirements that we have in law are, are good, but it still leaves a lot to the discretion of the Public Utilities Commission. And so that's why the engagement of all of you and even more people is so important to make sure that implementation is really effective. So where are we now in this process? We're really at the very, very early stages of figuring out what will be an iterative and long-term reoccurring process to make sure that the utilities are working to achieve our climate and clean energy goals. Um, the law requires a broad public process um, to, uh, at the outset, sorry, it requires a broad public process at the outset to uh, help inform the planning priorities. And so that is what the PUC has just launched now. Um, this series of workshops um, will drive towards a planning directive that the commission will issue to the utilities. And that planning directive will include the specific requirements that the utilities have to incorporate into their plans. So that's like what analysis, what methods, what tools, what assumptions about, uh, about growth and beneficial electrification or heat pumps and EVs need to be incorporated, what policies and programs should be anticipated, what kinds of community outreach the, the utilities have to do, what sort of reporting and status updates the utilities have to give us. So all of that detail is what we're driving for you know, and trying to urge the commission to put very, very specific, rigorous requirements on the utilities. And that's what this process is supposed to do. But this is a long arch, right? So, so once the utility, once the commission issues this directive to the utilities, they will have a year and a half to go out and do that work, to do that planning work, after which then they'll submit 
a, uh, a draft plan back to the public, and there'll be another process for public feedback at that point. Very long, long arch. And there's still a lot of unknowns. As we heard on Friday, the commission has yet to even set a schedule of workshops, uh, never mind determine the topics and the speakers, never mind sort of scope out that full arc of what we're looking at here. Um, so whether or not they'll be very proactive in seizing this opportunity, uh, we're still not really sure. But I think what we saw on Friday gives us cause for optimism as well as concern. And so, you know, that's what we'd really like to, to sort of flesh out with everybody today um, and help us make sense of what we saw on Friday. So we have our esteemed panelists here today to help us with that. We have Steve Klemmer, who is the Director of Energy Research and Analysis at the Union of Concerned Scientists. We have Oliver Tully, who's the Director of uh, Utility Innovation Initiative at the Acadia Center. And we have Phelps Turner, who is a senior attorney with the Conservation Law Foundation of Maine. Um, but many of you here on the panel too attended or have your own important perspectives to bring and questions to ask. So we really encourage everyone to uh, participate by asking questions in the chat or raising your hands um, and to, to contribute as we go along. Um, so I will pass it off now to Phelps to give us sort of a, a, a brief five minute overview of some of the highlights that he noted, and then we'll go on to Oliver and Steve to, to give sort of some overview and perspective from each of your perspectives before we open up to some questions to carry the conversation. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Rebecca, and thank, thank you for organizing this, and thank you to all the attendees. I uh, look forward to a good discussion. I'll, I'll just... Um, Give a few highlights as Rebecca suggested and look forward to hearing from my colleagues and from all of you. Uh, my, my initial impression uh, was that Friday's workshop was a, a good first step in this process toward not only more robust stakeholder uh, process at the commission, but also more holistic and forward-looking grid planning by, by the utilities. And I, I thought that there was um, thoughtful engagement um, by the commissioners and they seem to um, have a deep interest in moving this forward and improving engagement along the way. And for those um, who don't regularly participate in uh, commission proceedings, I think the, the stakeholder piece is, is an important one to, to highlight because um, it's often um, the case that uh, commission proceedings are limited to those, um, the utilities and uh, parties and, and those who are um, well-resourced and, and have the time and, and uh, resources to, to invest in these proceedings and the, the ability uh, and willingness of the commission to start um, reaching out and including more um, stakeholders in, in the process was, was really encouraging. I, I was also encouraged um, to hear, as we all did, that the commission has uh, engaged a facilitator. And I expect in future workshops, this will uh, improve outreach leading up to the workshops, participation during the workshops, and then gathering of feedback uh, after the workshops. Uh, the, the commission um, had uh, a good, good turnout. I think they did well at this opening phase to give um, stakeholders time and space uh, to be heard. And I think it would be really important going forward that that principle is applied uh, throughout so that, um, that all voices are heard during this important process. Uh, <clears throat> I think it'll also be important um, uh, to include other, other principles of, of stakeholder engagement, in, in particular the idea that um, whatever the commission uh, and utilities hear from stakeholders, that, that um, if there are questions or comments, that those things are responded to. Um, and not um, oftentimes um, when uh, there are stakeholder processes, these um, uh, comments and questions go into sort of a black box and you never really know how the utilities or the commissioner are receiving them. And I think it'll be important to, to have um, responses from the utilities uh, and, and the commission. <clears throat> um, I was also encouraged uh, to hear from, from both utilities about, about plans to expand their, their grid planning to factor in uh, policy drivers, including uh, clean energy and climate change. Uh, I guess on the other side of that coin, based on how much um, they're going to be adding to or, or supplementing to their planning, it was a little bit striking about how much they're not currently doing. And so I'm, I'm encouraged, but also, um, I guess, a bit discouraged that it, it, it took this um, 
this legislation that, that uh, motivated this, this process to really get this going. And I think um, it's, a, it's really a testament to the, to the power and importance of the, of the legislative process as a, as a, as a balance um, to how the executive branch exercises or, or doesn't exercise its authority with respect to its um, jurisdiction over, over utilities. Uh, I was also encouraged that the utilities um, plan to be taking a longer term approach to their, uh, to their grid planning. And it certainly will add to the complexity and even to the uncertainty uh, around the planning. But it's, I think it's really necessary when we're, when we're trying to make plans around uh, long term crises like, like the climate crisis. It's also clear to me from, uh, from the current planning processes and from what we heard on Friday that uh, forecasting um, uh, that underlies utility planning needs to improve dramatically. And I think we heard some commitments from the utilities to, to work on that. And I, I look forward to, to seeing how they, um, they improve that. And on that note, I would say I hope um, that the commission is able to loop in um, ISO New England, our regional grid operator, into the process, you know, even though they don't have jurisdiction over, over ISO New England, it'll be really important. We heard on Friday that, um, that the, uh, the planning that's happening at the regional level interacts you know, very directly with, uh, with grid planning at, at the state level. And um, I think there's a, a little bit of an over-reliance on, on regional forecasting that, that, can, be, that can lack the, the granularity uh, of, of data needed uh, to really dig into to what's needed uh, for the grid uh, here in, in Maine. Uh, and I think, uh, oh, one last thing, uh, another, another important aspect, we heard a little bit about this um, on Friday, but it'll be really important going forward that the, the grid planning and grid solutions that come out of it are, are cost effective and, and really take account of you know, the energy burdens facing uh, Maine rate payers. Um, I'll toss it back to Rebecca. Well, there's a lot of great points there that I think we'll circle back to for sure. And I think the question of, of granularity and how much visibility you need at what level to really make, uh, you know, have the potential to make cost effective long term investments is, a, is an important question that we'll circle back to. So, um, Steve, do you want to do you want to offer up some some of your perspectives at this point? Sure, thanks. And hi, everyone. Good, good afternoon. So, um, UCS, as many of you know, is a national organization, so we're kind of approaching some of these issues based on experiences we've had working on grid planning in other states, uh, particularly places like Minnesota and Michigan, California, um, and a few other places. Um, and I think there's some really great examples to bring forward there to help move this process forward. So, um, you know, as, as Phelps was saying, you know, there were some, I, I found some pretty encouraging comments from the PUC at the beginning of the meeting, uh, including about hiring a facilitator, which is something all of our groups had asked for. So that can, that can help free up some of the commission's time actually to participate in this proceeding um, more so than if they were trying to facilitate the process. Um, on the outreach side, you know, they specifically acknowledged outreach to EJ groups and tribes and other nonprofits, and also specifically mentioned using intervener funding to help facilitate that participation, which is something we've all been advocating for pretty strongly in a, in a separate docket at the PUC. Uh, in addition, you know, they, they also said they've been talking to some outside experts like the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and um, the Department of Energy. Uh, to bring in some outside expertise, which we think is also vitally important to this process. Uh, in terms of kind of building off what Phelps said about some of the positive things I heard from CMP and Versant, um, you know, they, they both really acknowledge the need for collaboration with multiple stakeholders and prioritizing stakeholder engagement early in the process, including getting input and agreement on inputs and assumptions and methodologies that will go into um, this modeling, which I think is vitally important. CMP also made an interesting comment about being more directly responsible to meeting customer needs. So we'll have to see <laughs> what's behind that statement and, uh, and if that really plays out. Um, and both uh, utilities acknowledged um, you know, that they were looking at other states. Um, CMP has been involved in New York. Um, Versant mentioned Hawaii, Minnesota, Michigan, Vermont specifically, and those are all things that we're, that we're tracking pretty closely too. So I thought that was encouraging. 
And then Versant, I think um, I was I was encouraged by you know their they they pretty clearly laid out how they were thinking about this differently than their current approach. And if you look at their their presentation that's online, it you know they kind of did a side by side comparison, saying this is this is what we plan on doing differently. So I thought that was very helpful um, in terms of the sort of questions and um, causes for concern. Um, I, I do think. On the stakeholder engagement side, there really wasn't all that many details about how this was going to happen and the, the potential for, you know, needing different kinds of stakeholder engagement on uh, the technical side versus, let's say, the, the public side. Um, I know in other states, there's very specific kind of public engagement process processes that the utilities do that's different than the technical side. And um, it's not really clear if the utilities are going to do that, if it's going to be led by the PUC or, or how that's going to go. Um, I also thought that the uh, CMP talked a little bit about putting out a climate protection plan, which I found to be pretty, pretty business as usual, um, kind of focused on they really emphasize tree trimming, which obviously is important since a lot of our outages are caused by trees falling on power lines. But I was hoping for a, you know, kind of a more detailed and thoughtful response in terms of other things that they were thinking about there. Um, and, and I also asked a question about this, but Versant, um, you know, specifically acknowledged that assumptions on the supply side, the generation side were really important to this process but really kind of had no specifics about how that was going to be brought in. The PUC was, was pretty silent on that too, which um, I was hoping that either they or, or other stakeholders that were in the room would have chimed in to, to talk about that because some of that has been done through the Climate Action Plan and other processes, but that information is now a couple of years old and we, and we know that things have changed pretty dramatically in the markets like increases in natural gas prices, the Federal Inflation Reduction Act has, has passed. And, and there's there's a bunch of things that have changed that are going to need to take a closer look at that and really is going to have an impact on how CMP and Versant plan their systems, you know, in terms of what transmission investments they're going to make, what uh, distribution investments and so forth. So that's a pretty important process, part of the process that I'm looking for more clarity on. Um, so um, I'll just stop there, but those were some of my initial observations. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Oliver, do you want to add some thoughts? Sure. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, just a few things. Um, I guess to begin with, uh, I'd say that I'm feeling cautiously optimistic about the proceeding overall, even though we're still very much at the beginning of it, and a lot of details have to be figured out. But I. I did get the impression that there was a general understanding of the importance of the proceeding and uh, good intentions in terms of trying to figure out how to do it well. Um, I think one thing that was notable for me was that at one point CMP said that greenhouse gas emission reductions are not part of their current planning processes and it would be hard for them to independently have put forward and defended a proposal to really accelerate the deployment of distributed energy resources uh, and electrification in a rate case at the PUC without having first gone through a grid planning process like this one to create a consensus around assumptions on scenario planning and other things. And I think whether or not you agree with CMP's perspective, I think the PUC sees the proceeding in a similar way. Um, and I think in general, those kinds of comments uh, speak to how important this proceeding can be in terms of creating the foundational inputs and assumptions for the investments that we need. Um, I'd also say that I'm not overly concerned at the moment with the amount of information or guidance that PUC has issued at this point, given that this planning process is so new to them. Um, and I understand they're in, desire to be quite deliberate about how they structure the process. Um, but I guess I reserve the right to be more concerned as we get more information. Um, uh, they made it clear that they plan to have 
a great space for more dialogue in the next sessions and I'm hopeful that that'll actually be the case rather than just presentations. Um, but it'll be our job to push the PUC to, to make sure that that happens and is done in an effective way. Um, Steve also mentioned the Climate Change Protection Plan, uh, which just for background is a separate requirement from the original bill. Um, in addition to this integrated planning, the utilities have to put together this climate change protection plan, which is about protecting utility infrastructure from climate change. And someone had asked CMP about it and the response um, I think was a little misleading. I think they gave the impression that climate was not a part of this planning process. I think they meant to just say that those are two requirements of the bill, but from our perspective, climate change is very much central to this plan proceeding uh, in that these great plans need to specifically work to help improve resiliency and help Maine um, meet its emission reduction requirements. Uh, and then in terms of some concerns I do have, I think one of the biggest obstacles as the proceeding gets underway is just institutional inertia from the part of utilities and the PUC in terms of figuring out how to do something like this, which they haven't really done before, uh, which I think just speaks to the importance of bringing in other voices, perspectives, and expertise. Um, I'm also concerned about the third-party facilitation. Um, I think technical expertise in distribution system planning does not necessarily translate into the skills needed for facilitating open dialogues. Uh, so I'm eager to see how that works out in terms of who the facilitator is for what portions of this proceeding. Um, and then finally, I'll just say that um, if that facilitation um, is not set up in a great way, I would be, I would worry about um, the quality or the uh, opportunity for stakeholders to provide input and review throughout the process, which will in turn affect how aggressive we are in terms of assumptions around scenario planning and all the other factors that go into the modeling that Steve was talking about um, that will inform what actually was, ends up being in these grid plans. Um, so yeah, for me, a little bit of a mixed bag, uh, but I'll pause there. Thank you, guys. That's um, there's a lot there to unpack. So um, if if others have specific questions around anything that was just raised, I really encourage you to just you know add it into the chat right now, or just raise your hand and please participate at any point here. There's there's some terms that were mentioned that I think we can kind of um, might serve us all well to unpack a little bit right now. Um, but I did just want to follow up on a point that Oliver made about how we're going to sort of help steer this uh, as public participants and advocates. And one thing I wanted to mention was that PUC did reference um, a plan uh, that it has in the procedural order that it issued that preceded this workshop that they plan to periodically sort of um, uh, um, pitch to the public a sort of understanding of where they think priorities are heading and things that have been sort of consensus points that have been sort of emerge, emerging through conversation and whatnot. And that could potentially be a really valuable way for sort of, uh, uh, you know, the commission and the public to be checking in with one another as this series of workshops proceed, you know, and so we can um, hopefully you know, if we all talk about the need for specific details for an outreach plan <laughs> at every single one of these meetings, I think it's very likely that that will emerge in, in whatever kind of, you know, incremental consensus building documents that are issued from the commission or this facilitator, for instance. Um, so I, I think, um, I think that just might end up being a very valuable way for us to steer this process if, if that um, happens frequently enough. Um, so one thing I wanted to maybe uh, get a little clarity for the group about, um, I thought would be helpful is intervener funding and, and Steve, you mentioned that, and that's sort of this parallel track. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what that is, what it intends to do, how it's available or not available, <laughs> um, at this point, um, and, and how in other states, for instance, this has successfully, 
uh, hopefully successfully um, uh, complemented public processes like this. Yeah, so uh, the PUC had opened a docket um, over the past, I don't know, six to eight months, I guess, um, around intervener funding. There's, a, there's actually been an intervener funding provision in place in Maine for many, many years, um, but it hasn't been used. And um, I think the, the recent legislation basically that, that came out of um, some other legislation that was basically about how, how can state agencies prioritize um, uh, in, environmental justice um, organizations and disadvantaged communities in state agency decision making. And that led to um, some work that the, the governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future did, some listening sessions, and a recommendation came out of that process that, that basically said that the uh, commission should um, change its intervener funding rule to help prioritize and encourage that participation. So we went through that process and uh, all, all of our groups on this call were part of that. And um, the commission actually just issued their final rule on it. Um, and they've been, they've said in a couple of different settings that they're they're very interested in getting um, you know groups like that and, and tribes too um, more involved in the decision making process. And we've really encouraged them to kind of follow some of the rules around procedural equity equity in terms of the process of how they reach out to them and and where to try to get um, better engagement um, in different ways than they're used to doing because you know they're <laughs> they're used to just putting out a notice and letting groups kind of opt into the process which typically ends up being you know our, our groups in terms of um, NGOs and so there there's a need to really like, um, reach out in different ways to, to those communities and those organizations. Um, and so it's still, you know, the rules just was just finalized. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's taken advantage of it yet, but one important um, thing that we advocated for and the, and the PUC adopted was that they, um, this part participation and this funding be available for different kinds of proceedings, not just adjudicatory proceedings, but also non-adjudicatory proceedings, um, because there's just so many decisions that the PUC makes in these different venues that have impacts on these communities. And so it's um, that was really a positive development too. And at this point, um, you know, the PUC kind of um, said they weren't going to put a cap on how much funding uh, was going to be available because they're not entirely clear what the demand is going to be for this. Um, and so I think, you know, it's partially up, not just up to our groups, but I think our groups can help facilitate and reach out to um, these communities um, and other community-based organizations to get more involved in the process and to um, actually seek this funding so that it'll allow them to cover their time and participate. So there's a lot well, a lot to do going forward um, to bring bring them more into the process and a lot of education that's going to be needed too because it's some of these things are incredibly technical and um, you know I think our groups can also help on that front too. Great, thank you. Um, if, if nobody else has anything else to add on the intervener funding. Um, there's a question here about efficiency main trust. Um, and uh, that aligns with a question I was going to pose to the group too, where, um, you know, efficiency main trust is a really unique body that we've created here in Maine. And that may make us quite different from how other states are dealing with the challenges of integrated grid planning. Um, and I, I was just wondering what, what you guys envision the role of efficiency main trust being. Um, in a holistic approach to the grid. We, we heard a bit from them that they see themselves in a sort of market enabling point of view to help sort of lay some of the groundwork to support the market. But if the market doesn't show up, then you know some of these programs will have to be administered by this quasi-government agency instead of the market itself. And um, I just wonder with, with, with your perspectives um, from other states, especially, um, where you see efficiency main trust sort of positioning itself 
um, or being positioned in this in this process and in the clean energy transition overall. Who wants to take that one? Oliver, I see you. Yeah, I, I can jump in. Um, yeah, the trust is unique, as you say, among states in the country. And I think just because they are a separate entity, it does add some complexity to how this planning gets done. Um, but I think they are a really strong organization that can help improve it overall. So I think you're right in terms of the work that they can do to grow the market. I think one area where they will, where they will be really helpful is in terms of providing um, input and data uh, and other information that can go into the utility modeling efforts. So Steve mentioned uh, the description that Versant, for example, included on how integrated grid planning would um, lead to different work for them in terms of their scenario forecasting uh, around different load growth futures, testing sensitivities for electrification or distributed energy resources. Um, and I think the trust will be really important for feeding into that modeling process and providing some of that the data that they have to make sure that that modeling of those inputs are accurate um, and align with the work that the trust has been doing. Um, does anyone, uh, following up on EMT, can anyone define for us what a DERMS is? Efficiency Main Trust referenced this. Oliver, you wanna take that one too? Sure, uh, it stands for Distributed Energy Resource Management System. Um, and based on my understanding, it is a software system that allows for much more advanced uh, and dynamic uh, management of distributed energy resources responding to conditions on the grid in a much more sophisticated way. Um, it, uh, is kind of a, it, a really important piece of modernizing the grid overall uh, and allowing for the incorporation and proliferation of the advanced resources and technologies that um, uh, we want to see on the grid. Um, I'm not a technical expert or engineer, uh, so others can add more, but that is kind of a, a basic description of it. I'll add that that my understanding is that they have recently contracted for a software developer to provide a Derms platform for Maine to help us uh, be able to in aggregate dispatch things like uh, battery storage units at the residential levels for consumers who have already bought these batteries and they're just sitting in the basement pretty much just being used uh, when there's an outage and otherwise are there but not being used in any way that benefits the grid. And so these kinds of platforms called a DERMS platform would allow for you know, a system operator or an aggregator who's taking a signal from the system operator to turn on and off those units, um, you know, be them a couple hundred or a couple thousand um, that you know, individually don't amount to much, but in aggregate could significantly uh, reduce demand on the system during expensive times. Um, and so um, other states in New England actually have programs that permit this kind of flexibility of battery units, but uh, so Maine is a little bit behind the curve, but um, hopefully that uh, that work at Efficiency Maine Trust will, will gear up quickly and allow us to participate. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the kind of dynamic flexibility that we're sort of talking about here in terms of reducing costs and, and maximizing the, the utility of the overall grid system. Um, uh, let's see. So I wanted to ask, uh, we heard this sort of chunky peanut butter analogy a couple times and you know I'm not sure it really made sense to me necessarily but <laughs> I have an understanding of what it means I, I think it was in the in the context of um, CMP's 
comments at the outset um, when they indicated that they would actually have a preference for this process to focus on investments at the sort of transmission to distribution interface as opposed to across the distribution system because we just don't know where you know a bunch of EVs will be added or a bunch of solar might be added that would stress the distribution system. But at the at the larger transmission to distribution system, we have maybe better understanding of where we can expect those um, investment upgrades to be needed or something to that effect. But either way, I'd like to hear from you guys what you think the chunky peanut butter analogy means. And you know, also why it came up. It came up a number of times over the course of the the, the workshop. So clearly resonated. Steve Phelps, do, do either of you want to jump in there? Uh, well, go ahead, Phelps. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just say, Re Rebecca, um, that that was a great summary. That's my understanding as well. I, it did come up a lot. I. You know, tr traditional uh, transmission investments are typically quite lumpy in the sense that they they are bigger um, and uh, aren't aren't necessarily as right sized, meaning that um, it can be hard to determine exactly what size investment you need. And this goes, I think, in my opinion, ties back to the to the granularity of the forecasting and and, uh, and data analysis that's being conducted in terms of how accurate it is. And it's very difficult to, to accurately forecast into the future, especially as you get further out, say beyond 10 and, and in particular 20 years. Uh, so the, it shows the importance of, of better, uh, more granular data, not just from the utilities, but also I think uh, we deserve and need better uh, and more granular data from ISO New England um, so that we can um, we can make the, the investments um, that we need, but not, um, oversize them it's steep yeah that, that's that's basically what i was going to say too but i but i would also just add to that that um you know the transmission investments that are going to be need to be made to meet maine's climate and clean energy goals are also vitally important so we know there is a a big project from arista county in northern maine big transmission line that's going to get built we know that um to actually deploy offshore wind which uh, is also something a lot of our groups are working on. You know, there's the question of, well, do you invest in, you know, the transmission that's needed for one project to bring it to the shore? Or do you, or is it um, seems like it's a lot smarter to th be thinking about, you know, a broader swath of investments that are going to be needed uh, in Maine and elsewhere and, and connecting those uh, transmission investments together and where that's going to come ashore. So there's a lot of, um, connection there between you know what I raised before on the generation side and and what's going to be needed to um, support that generation in Maine and, and the region so those are also very bulky expensive investments um, that are going to need to be considered in this process in some way thanks I think that that relates to um, something I heard, which was a potentially concerning over us over emphasis on capital investments um, from the utilities, you know, whether in the name of proactive planning, which is often something we're we're asking for um, to get more headroom for um, increased uh, heat pumps, for instance, or other DER distributed energy resources put on the grid or with respect to a longer planning horizon, if, if all of a sudden the utilities now are expected to plan for load growth, growth and demand for electricity out to 20, 30, 40 years, that's going to mean an overinvestment in the kinds of decisions that they would be making now to anticipate that sort of growth. And, and this process, as I sort of try to uh, lay out in the context uh, in the outset of today's work uh, conversation, you know, supposed to try to keep those those in, those uh, investments um, in check and to vet them and control them and we're getting some questions in the in the chat here from Randall about sort of how how is this process supposed to improve that decision making to make sure that we're sizing incremental investments correctly um, and I think that that's really the challenge here you know what we heard CMP say that um, in the current cluster study process where they analyze a bunch of different DR proposals um, and what the impact of these various solar, usually solar projects are going to have 
um, in a certain region of the grid, there's no pathway, there's no clear pathway for the utility to decide to make a larger investment to accommodate the current sort of proposals that are out there for, for solar projects. Um, and so I just was wondering if, you know, this is this is sort of a little kind of gray area, but if 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 you guys could talk about this need to balance, um, you know, uh, giving that headroom, overbuilding the system to the extent that we can anticipate, you know, what DR are going to be added where, but while also, you know, keeping in check the 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 interests of the utility in in overbuilding and getting permission from the utilities to to write that off to, to rate payers. Yeah, I think that's an extremely important point. Um, so one of the reasons why we are focused so much on incorporating independent uh, analysis and review of what the utilities are doing is to make sure that uh, the proposals are where they need to be in terms of deployment of clean energy resources and meeting our uh, climate change and greenhouse gas reduction requirements. The other important reason is to make sure that uh, what's in the proposal is not um, an attempt basically just to put forward a bunch of investment that can be gold plated and that the utilities see this as an opportunity to get a green light from the PUC now with um, a stamp of approval from a lot of different stakeholders apparently to put forward a bunch of uh, expensive investment. Um, so that's why we really need that independent review to make sure that those investments are sensible, uh, they invest in the right resources, they are unnecessarily expensive, um, and deliver benefits uh, for a broad set of customers and stakeholders uh, beyond um, the, the interest that utilities may have in participating in this. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that Oliver said. I just want I just wanted to add, I think um it's it's clear that um with uh you know the increased electrification that's coming in, in multiple sectors that we will need um a better grid uh going forward. But I think um that needs to start first and foremost with getting more out of our current grid. Um and, and there are things like um grid enhancing technologies uh to allow more power to be distributed over what we already have. So we don't need to build unnecessarily. And we heard a little bit on, on Friday at the workshop about non-wires alternatives. So this needs to be become, become more reflexive and more integrated into the into the utility grid planning where utilities explore if they if they need an upgrade to the grid, could that um, could that upgrade be uh, achieved um, in a way other than uh, new wires or or poles? Um, and that's an, and but I mean to get back to your original point uh, or question, Rebecca, I think it, it all comes down to a balancing you know between you know reliability uh, you know we need a reliable grid but also uh what's it what do we need what size do we need and, and how much is it going to cost and we really need to find um, a, a balance there and think about what the impacts are on uh, on rate payers um, as well so that we're not overbuilding in terms of the, the actual space and geography that we need but also what what's what's it costing um rate payers Steve, do you have anything on that point? I wasn't sure if I saw you unmute at some point. No, okay. no, not really. I was also responding to another question, so it's a little distracted. There's um there's some questions coming in about sort of local engagement and and what this can mean for local communities, municipalities that want to take their clean energy future into their own hands. Um, and, you know, in some cases may face, um, you know, very specific system constraints within the utilities territory. Um, and I was wondering if you guys have some perspective on, on what this means for local entities that want to take things into their own hands. Steve, do you want to see if you can answer that one? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I do think there's an opportunity for that and um, including participating in this process, you know, from some local community representatives, but I also see it, um, you know, tying into um, the discussions we were having around the climate protection plan and uh, local communities that are trying to prepare themselves for, um, you know, 
resilient increasing resilience in response to increasing extreme weather events and and climate change and there's you know actually two two aspects to that one is the um adding resilience and adaptation measures that some communities are thinking about but also on the emission reduction side in terms of reducing the impacts of climate change and obviously um, you know, communities are interested in doing that and can can actually save money in the process um, by implementing certain kinds of measures. But um, really, to to achieve that goal, we also need um, the state and the country and the world to also be uh, achieving those emission reductions too. But I think Maine can set a great example for that, and and local communities can lead the way in setting that example. I'll also add that um, it's my understanding that uh, the PUC has hired an outreach coordinator and I'm not, I don't know a lot about it, but one of the things I'm hopeful for in terms of how this proceeding is going forward is seeing that um, be integrated in, the, in this process. And um, my impression about how an outreach coordinator would be important is to directly engage with uh, local entities and municipalities um, to get their input into this process. Um, there are examples uh, from Oregon, for example, where the utilities uh, were required to work directly with community-based organizations to co-develop solutions uh, in their integrated grid planning process. Uh, and that might be a model to look to for how to structure this. Um, but I think that could be uh, an important uh, figure and hopefully is a good sign that the, the PUC is uh, interested in investing in those outreach resources. I'll add to that, um, you know, one of the ways that we innovate is through pilots. And I think that there will be a lot of um, ideas proposed throughout this process that are new and too challenging for the commission or utilities to embrace wholeheartedly. But if we propose them as a small incremental experimental test case, um, then we can begin to push the envelope a bit. And I think that we should think of this as a core strategy in how we engage this process to be always vigilant for what opportunities can we sort of push uh, as a pilot. Um, and in, in those opportunities and those conversations around piloting, there may be, they have to be, usually they're going to be geographic in some, some way. Um, a pilot would deal with a certain section of the grid where there's a constraint and perhaps there's a different set of solutions that could be brought in, for instance. Um, and so there, I'm going to be thinking about opportunities to leverage local interest and capacity um, in experimenting around some of these solutions um, as the as the procedure proceedings uh, move forward. Um, and one other thing I wanted to mention um, that the, uh, the the statute actually contains some degree of like very prescriptive elements that have to be required by the commission of these plans, <clears throat> including an assessment of. Um, environmental equity and environmental justice impacts of the utilities grid plans. And that's a specific requirement that these plans have to include, yet there's a whole bunch of questions raised about how the utility is going to go about doing that kind of an assessment. And I think that offers us, um, the public and the advocates, an opportunity, a hook to really sort of question what that means and what kinds of background outreach should be required on um, what kinds of pilots, what kind of community engagement should be required to sort of um, for the utilities to get experience um, with those issues, which right now really it doesn't have too much experience with those that set of issues. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. Um, let's see, are there other questions here? Was there a particular sort of perspective um, that was missing or a particular idea that was missing that we really want to, as we think about, you know, um, presenting uh, certain witnesses, um, bring, connecting the commission to certain um, experts to bring in and provide perspective over the course of these workshops, 
you know, was there an obvious perspective that was missing um, based, for instance, on your, your experience um, tracking how this has unfolded in other states, perhaps? Uh, Phelps, do you want to talk about that? Um, sure. A couple of things come to mind. Um, uh, uh, and I, I mean, it's early in the process, so I don't want to um, jump to any conclusions about, but, but I think uh, outreach needs to be expanded to to try and uh, let folks know and 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 engage folks um, in frontline communities uh, who are hit, being hit first and worst by by climate change, um, and um, sort of understand and have input on what um, what the grid needs to do for them, but also what the impacts of, of grid um, grid development is on, on their communities. And uh, another is, I think, secondarily, um, clean energy developers. You know that. They have an important, uh, you know, as, as we develop more, uh, in particular, distributed energy resources, um, making sure that we're connecting them at, at the appropriate points within the grid so that we don't overbuild um, where, where we don't need it and tr trying to be more proactive about planning out where, where that clean energy development happens so that the, the wind and solar is coming on in, in an effective place. Um, that, that's, I think, another voice that we could, um, that we could include. Steve, anything that comes to mind in this area? Uh, yeah, I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there was acknowledgement of participation from tribes and EJ groups and others, but I, it wasn't clear at all to me if they were represented in the first call or what the plan is going forward. And so I'm, I'm assuming that's going to be built in, but I, it's not entirely clear to, to what extent and how that's going to be done. So that's something we need to pay attention to. Um, I also think that, you know, the, as kind of Phelps was alluding to some of this outside technical expertise and perspective, um, whether that's just going to be kind of a consult consultative type basis or whether it's going to be, they're actually going to be part of this process, which we've seen in other states. And in particular, um, you know, in, in places like Minnesota and Michigan, where we've been involved, and I'm, I'm acknowledging it's a little bit different because there's vertically integrated utilities in those states. But, um, you know, in those processes, we brought in independent expert uh, modeling that's separate from what the utilities are doing to help challenge some of the assumptions, challenge, you know, some of the scenarios and so forth that are putting forward. And um, that's been a pretty effective approach. And so, it's not clear exactly how how or if that's going to be part of this process or not, but um, something I'm looking forward to hearing more about from the PUC. Oliver, do you want to add anything there? We approach the last couple minutes here. Yeah, I'll, I'll, those um, gaps definitely stuck out at me uh, too. And I guess I'm just hopeful that We'll get more clarity on that as it goes forward. Um, one other thing that was mentioned at the very end of the uh, workshop or in terms of potential topics for subsequent sessions was like a presentation from the Office of the Public Advocate and the work they've been doing on the non-wires alternative coordinator work. And I'm just, um, I'm a little concerned about how that's gonna be fully integrated into this process and uh, improved um, because I think there are some barriers that the OPA is facing in doing that well that they, uh, they know very intimately. Um, but I'm just a little concerned about how that's going to feed in and whether it's well positioned enough to really be a strong uh, part of this overall planning process and whether the OPA is resourced enough um, to, to do what the original legislation uh, set out to do. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so I, I'm just gonna offer a couple closing thoughts as we round out the hour here. Um, first, I just wanna thank you all for participating. This is so important. And I just really you know, urge you to stay engaged over the long haul here. Uh, for next steps over the short term, we expect the commission to bring on a facilitator as we've mentioned. And so we should be hearing more from, 
from her. Um, and we expect the next workshop to be scheduled for March when, as Oliver just said, we'll likely be hearing from the Office of Public Advocate about their non-wires alternative process with an eye to how it should be synchronized with this grid planning process. And perhaps we'll hear from the Governor's Energy Office too, where we can sort of uh, maybe steer towards some of that supply side cohesion that, that Steve was mentioning. Um, the stakes are really high here. This is going to be a long, long arc, um, but I think the fundamentals are pretty straightforward, that this is about instituting a transparent and participatory regulatory approach to vet utility plans and operations to help ensure that these incremental investments are really serving our climate and clean energy goals and to help us find cheaper better solutions to what the utilities are proposing. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty, but we know one thing for sure that if we if we do this poorly, the utilities interests will dominate and that'll result in you know, a costly overbuild of the system. But if we do this right, we can center the needs of main people and build a flexible, low cost, clean, resilient grid, all the things that we want. Um, and that's really, we've mentioned the in Inflation Reduction Act a couple of times, but I think that this is all the more so with uh, now billions of dollars that are coming available to states to support this kind of work. And if we have this framework in place, we can steer those resources and make them really smart, uh, smartly um, position them to accelerate this transition. Um, so again, I just thank you all so much for participating and I really encourage you to reach out and stay in touch um, to any of us and get others involved to follow up with questions. Um, and we look forward to continued conversations. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Um, and I just dropped in the chat uh, a sign up form. If you wanna stay engaged in this process, make sure you're signed up for NRCM's email alerts and particularly when there's opportunities for the public to weigh in, we will definitely let you all know. Um, and this will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel if there are things that you'd like to go back and revisit. Um, but thank you so much and thank you to all of our panelists and everyone have a great day. Bye-bye.